When I do learn something that it's important that I can use in my work, it's like, oh, thank you, that in my life I've been able to pick that grain of wisdom up. Conductor, pianist, television presenter and educator, Sir Antonio Papano. He's been hailed as a master of his craft and an inspirational communicator. And the people who say that are opera singers. Tony is so astute and dedicated to the why of any music, why it was written, what is it telling us, what is the protagonist carrying in their heart and mind in this moment of musical language that we should listen to. Solo instrumentalists. What I really uh, admire and what I'm really grateful for to Tony Papano is he is willing to always do better. It's absolutely a rare quality because every time that he goes on stage, you can feel that it's like his first time and he always wants to give his best to every kind of audience. Orchestral players. He commands his Roman troops in the most clever and most inspired way, being both very demanding but also very fatherly sometimes and helping us humanly in order to achieve the best possible technical results. And audiences. He conveys his artistic convictions to the musicians through a very clear and respectful interpretation of the music. This requires hard work, talent and passion. He has them all. We heard the voices of conductor Sir Antonio Papano, baritone Thomas Hampson, pianist Beatrice Rana, violinist and conductor Roberto Gonzalez Monias, and opera connoisseur and patron Elizabeth Mernier. And on this recording here, Sir Antonio is conducting the orchestra of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden in Siegfried's Rhine Journey, the orchestral interlude linking the prologue and the first act of Wagner's Götterdämmerung, the final opera in his cycle Der Ring des Nibelungen. For the last 17 years, Maestro Papano has been having iconic success as the Royal Opera House's music director, and not only as an electrifying conductor, but also as a charismatic and magnetic presenter of television and YouTube introductions to the operas he conducts. For the last 14 years, he's also been the music director of the Orchestra dell'Accademia Nazionale di Santa Cecilia, the Santa Cecilia Orchestra, in Rome. And with them, he's built up a devoted new following in the city and on television. Again, both as a conductor and a communicator about music. Additionally, he has been devotedly teaching and nurturing the careers of young performers, singers and instrumentalists. And there's still more. He finds time to play as a virtuoso pianist and accompanist for international singers' recitals. We're covering all these remarkable maverick elements of his life, with the help of himself in his own words, and the words of the musicians and audiences he inspires, in this four-part feature on Lyric FM, celebrating Antonio Papano's 60th birthday this year. And as well as playing many of his CD recordings, we've been able to arrange specially for these programmes that we can include some uniquely valuable archive recordings from the Royal Opera House Covent Garden and from RAI, Radio Televisione Italiana. All of this for this documentary, Sir Antonio Papano, Mission for Music. <laughs> The lights have everywhere been brighter, people happier, more to buy, more money to spend. The doubts and fears that nagged at our minds at previous post-war Christmases have passed away. So there was nothing to prevent Great Britain having a great Christmas. Christmas 1959 in London. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan had proclaimed to Britain, you have never had it so good. And he even meant, rightly or wrongly, refugees and immigrants. Refugee children who don't have treats normally were remembered too.
as well as refugees, in the 1950s there'd been a surge of immigrants settling in the United Kingdom. The official policy, for a time, was to welcome and encourage them. Many Italian immigrants came to settle in the southeast of England, particularly in some suburbs in and around London. And in the Christmas week of 1959, in one suburb, just outside the eastern edge of London, Carmela Maria and Pasquale Papano, who'd recently come to England from the south of Italy, were anxiously awaiting the arrival of their first child. Several days later, on the 30th of December, he arrived. I was born in Epping, in Essex. My parents were domestic workers in a well-to-do household. They had just recently um, immigrated from Italy. And soon after I was born, we, uh, they moved to London. They, through some friends and family and connections, uh, were able to land a council flat in Westminster. And um, yeah, and I spent my early youth there. My father was a singer, a tenor, um, but from a, an early point in his career, he uh, taught singing, um, probably out of necessity to feed the family, and, but he had a knack for it more than that. He was, he was very good. And um, so there was a piano at the house. And at, when I was six years old, and probably spurred on also by the, the experiences at school, because at that time there were although it was quite rudimentary, but there were lessons in music. So I, the idea of taking piano lessons was not uh, something that came from left field. Um, not that I was overwhelmed or overjoyed with practicing the piano. I much preferred, you know, playing football with, with my friends outside. But, you know, I had my hands on the keyboard and that's very important. Um, I also, was exposed to any number of singers and voice types. And of course, the singer psyche, which is <laughs> hugely important uh, to being able to understand them and work with them. I didn't know that at the, at the time, of course. But I was always, and for a very, very long time, because I did that with my father, um, when I was good enough at the piano, I started accompanying his students and I did that with my father for about 12 years. So I really uh, learned the song repertoire, especially the Italian old uh, arias, and, but not only, uh, because um, the singers would sometimes bring in pop music and you know, I learned to sight read and all that. And, um, but I, I was very, very connected with the singers from the get-go. And this was um, very important for my formation, for understanding about breathing, about singing, and about, you know, what it takes, and voice placement that, you know, which is in many teachers' definitions a kind of voodoo, you know, because it's an invisible <laughs> instrument, it's very elusive, and it's very, very, um, yeah, there's a snake charmer kind of thing about how to describe the processes that make for good singing. But um, I was interested, you know, to a certain point, and I, I was always with older people. That was very interesting. So I, I grew up surrounded by people who were much older than I, and that also marked me. You know, I, I grew up very, very quickly because I had to. But uh, England was a kind of doer place uh, during the, the 60s and uh, certainly the early 70s before we moved to America in 19... 73. I have fond memories of that time, but also um, memories of watching my parents work so hard and to try to, you know, scrape together a living. And, you know, my mother had three jobs and, you know, she cleaned offices. She, she even brought my brother and I, my younger brother, uh, to clean offices in the morning at five o'clock in the morning before we went to school. I, I, I was six, seven years old cleaning offices in the morning. So all to say that that whole immigrant work ethic thing was instilled in me from the beginning. Um, I admire my parents 
for the sacrifices or for the efforts that they made to have a, a better life I mean, than they had growing up, certainly. I mean, they came from a village, a small, very, very poor village in the south of Italy. And, um, and that marked them, obviously. And they, it, for them, it was very important to have also certain material things that were unimaginable when they were growing up. So work, 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 work. I look at myself now and nothing much has changed. Uh, it is uh, work, 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 work. I don't have time much for, to enjoy the material things that I can afford, but I have been afforded a, a, a most extraordinary life in music and uh, a, a journey that is probably, when I look back, highly improbable from a kid who's you know playing the G major romance of Beethoven uh, and the, the theme of Match of the Day on the piano to being the music director of Covent Garden. That's a, that's a pretty long trek and that's a far distance. And, uh, but I think it came about because my parents created a discipline for work in my whole idea of being. Uh, just made it somehow the principle in my life. And music requires a tremendous dedication. Uh, music is a very tough mistress. It's, it's, I mean, it requires all kinds of attention. And when you think you know everything, you know absolutely nothing. And I find that being able to continue in this career, in this uh, life as a musician, it's an incredible privilege not only to be next to all manner of great masterpieces, whether they be orchestral pieces, they be operatic pieces, whether it's the song repertoire with piano or it's just the solo piano or chamber music, is that I truly find out how much I have to learn every day. And when I do learn something that it's important that I can use in my work, it's like, oh, thank you that in my life I've been able to pick that grain of wisdom up. Um, but that's what, that's what a real career, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to continue learning. And uh, if you're like me, you get to tell people what to do and how to do it and hopefully honoring the whole idea of what being a maestro is, is that the beauty of the word teacher, that you can inform people, share with them information that you've picked up on this road. You bring to mind a quote from Leonard Bernstein who said in German, there's only one little letter that distinguishes what we call learning and teaching, lernen and lehren. And I think that's very nice that you've said the same thing, that they're completely interrelated. Absolutely. And I, don't, I, I think um, certainly I'm learning from everybody that that sits in front of me in an orchestra, and certainly everybody I work with, singers and instrumentalists. And um, that's a fantastic thing. If you have the humility and open ears, my God, you come out of it on top. You really do. When this recording of Puccini's La Rondine appeared relatively early in Sir Antonio Papano's career in 1997, it made a smash hit success with an opera that had been relatively neglected for most of its life. And that was because of the exceptional chemistry and creative collaboration between the principal singers and the conductor in the kind of mutual interplay of ideas and priorities that Sir Antonio was referring to before. In practical terms, it's an outstanding example of conducting that's simultaneously leadership and accompaniment, the very essence of operatic conducting, but realized here to an exceptional degree of precision and flexibility all in one. 
In this scene in Bullier's nightclub in Paris, the inspired virtuoso singing of Angela Giorgio as Magda with her newfound and a lot younger lover Ruggiero, superbly sung by Roberto Alagna, is given an intoxicating orchestral backing, so to speak, in the way in which Antonio Papano shapes, propels and accompanies the lover's waltzing with such remarkable subtlety and panache. A perfect unanimity of solo singing, choral singing and orchestral playing as Magda starts to feel she is back in the days of her youth and as the lovers hold each other tightly, they sing. In the soft caress of the dance, I close my eyes to dream. Everything now is far away, nothing can trouble me and the past seems to vanish. ago I remember Tony Papano, everyone calls him Tony, I remember him saying to me about La Rondine, I love this music. And then later on he said the same words in the same way, full of unbridled joy and passionate involvement about the other operas he was discussing with me that day, how he loved their stories, their words and of course their music. It's his intense immersion in opera and his blazing conviction about the dramatic and psychological experience of it, the entire human power of it, that lies behind the force and vision of his opera conducting. My life and the theatre pieces that I have to deal with become so intertwined, not that my life is an opera plot, it's much too boring, <laughs> uh, I'm much too boring for that, but but my thoughts and my talent and whatever intelligence uh, I've been given is really trying to understand conflict, the motivations of each character, the whys, the hows, what is needed for potential resolution and why do most operas lead to total annihilation and, and, and tragedy and um, 
And then the sadness of all that. I mean, uh, you can't help but be affected by this. You just are. Verdi's La Forza del Destino, The Force of Destiny. Leonora has come to a monastery to request the Father Superior, Padre Guardiano, to take her in so that she can live out the rest of her life as a secluded recluse after the tragedy and horror of past events. Her father, a proud Spanish Marquis, violently opposed her love for a half-caste nobleman from Peru called Don Alvaro. And when the Marquis confronted Don Alvaro with his soldiers, Don Alvaro offered peace and submission by throwing his gun on the ground. But accidentally, it discharged and killed the Marquis. In the confusion that immediately followed, Leonora and Don Alvaro were separated, and they have lost all contact with each other. And meanwhile, Leonora's brother, Don Carlo, is fanatically fixated on one aim finding Leonora and Don Alvaro so that he can kill them both for causing the death of his father and bringing shame on his family, the aristocratic Di Vargas ancestry. And it was in between performances during a new production of this opera at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden that Sir Antonio Papano was speaking with us specially for this program. I'm in the process right now of conducting a series of performances of The Force of Destiny, uh, by Giuseppe Verdi. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have wonderful, wonderful casts. And um, it's music that means very, very much to me. I, I used to play uh, the tenor part for my father. And um, it's an opera that many have deemed imperfect because of its sprawling nature and, it, and, and, and how it spends too much time away from the soloist. But the time it does spend with the main protagonists is so moving and so utterly tragic and sad and unfortunate. Therefore, Verdi needs to find comfort, solace in the spiritual element. And this is very, very important in this opera. I mean, much has been made of Verdi's uh, uh, sort of very um, negative, shall we say, relationship with the church, but, but he was a spiritual man. He grew up with the, certainly the Catholic ritual. He knew what the prayers meant, um, what was behind those prayers. And like any Italian of that period, and so, and you feel this in a very, very strong way in this opera. All bar one of Leonora's arias, and she has several, are prayers. And it's very important. And so, I personally uh, don't go to church every week. But through these scenes, through conducting these scenes, through rehearsing these scenes, through having, you know, a real relationship and confrontation with this text and this music, I feel that I'm being certainly nourished spiritually and I'm made to ask questions and, um, and being certainly tested as Leonora is tested by the Padre Guardiano. And I think that's how I've chosen to live my life, through, through the music that I conduct.
in this performance of Verdi's La Forza del Destino, conducted by Sir Antonio Papano from Covent Garden last April, Anna Netrebko sang the role of Leonora. Outside the monastery, before ringing the bell to ask to be admitted, she prays to the Virgin Mary and to God to forgive her sin. And as she then hears the sounds of the monk's matin song coming from inside the monastery, she sings, May this music bring comfort and peace to my troubled soul. This spiritual element of God and Il Signore, Dio, and uh, La Vergine degli Angeli, and all these important figures of the Christian Catholic faith are there as hope, redemption, comfort, and even in the face of utter annihilation. I find Leonora one of the greatest, for me, of all Verdi's creations, because what comes through, I feel in that, is something that I also feel in the Requiem Mass, that here was a man who was an atheist, but understood the importance of religion for the people, for what Leonora, the only way that she can really survive in this terrible, doomed world she's in. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the whole theme, I find it so eternally with Verdi, everything contemporary. I mean, here we have family pride, family hubris, family arrogance, and fa in the case only of the father, but not only the father, of course, the son, Don Carlo, um, family r racism. racism. Of course, racism is a huge issue. I mean, some of the things he says about Don Alvaro and, and to him directly, I mean, he calls him vermin, I mean, his race, you know, and... I mean, it's really disgusting, and um, my God, we have so many parallels today of that kind of just unalloyed hatred and total incomprehension and bias.
After more than 18 months, Don Carlo, in fact by accident, finally caught up with Don Alvaro and tried to kill him in a duel that was broken up by soldiers. Don Alvaro, just like Leonora, decided then to give his life up and spend his remaining days in the seclusion of a monastery. But Don Carlo will never give up his obsessive fixation on revenge. And five years later, he has tracked Don Alvaro down to the monastery, where, disguised as a monk, he confronts him and tells him he is going to kill him. Don Alvaro, as has always been the case, does not want any violence and he falls to his knees and begs Don Carlo for peace, forgiveness and pity. But when Don Carlo insults him about his race and then strikes him across the face, he has no alternative but to fight a duel. <laughs> From the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, in Verdi's La Forza del Destino, Jonas Kaufmann and Lodovic Tessier were Don Alvaro and Don Carlo, and they were singing with the orchestra of the Royal Opera House, conducted by Sir Antonio Papano. And we are grateful to the Royal Opera House for giving us that extract from their recording of the performance for this programme. That extra special electricity and tension with such riveting dramatic spontaneity and unanimity between the singers and the orchestra came, just like it did in La Rondine earlier in this programme, from the exceptional rapport that exists between Antonio Papano and all the performers when he conducts. The baritone Thomas Hampson tells us now about the unusually high and vivid level of Maestro Papano's communication with singers. He loves singers, he loves and understands breathing and articulation and singing sound and resonance. And that has always been a big calling card amongst our singing community. I personally admire his unbridled musical curiosity and it's marvelous to see the, the command of respect that he generates from his musicians, the amazing devotion that all of his singers have of him, both for his musical and vocal adeptness. Uh, and he's just a hell of a nice guy. And my goodness, where are you going to find all of those attributes in one person? Thomas Hampson is singing the role of the Marquis of Posa here in Verdi's Don Carlos. 
a performance that was conducted by Antonio Papano at the Châtelet Theatre in Paris in 1996. And it was a trailblazer because it set a new level of success for the original French language version of the opera, which had mainly been taking second place to Verdi's revision of the work in Italian. In this scene, Posa, a passionate zealot for human rights, takes the extraordinarily daring step of confronting King Philip II of Spain, the tyrannical ruler over more than half of Europe. He tells him that through his ruthless oppression of the people of Flanders who want independence, the country is in a terrible state of poverty and disease, and he begs him to allow the people their freedom. Thomas Hampson as Rodrigue, the Marquis of Posa, in the original French version of Verdi's Don Carlos, with Sir Antonio Papano conducting at the Châtelet Theatre in Paris. Six years after that performance, in 2002, Tony Papano began his tremendously successful music directorship of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden where his presence has been inspiring singers, orchestras and the house's audiences to stratospheric levels. Elizabeth Mernier is a connoisseur opera goer and a patron of the Royal Opera House and that has enabled her to see Antonio Papano not only in performances but also in rehearsals. I have never seen a conductor so committed to the singers on stage. He keeps contact with them all the time by all methods. Not only he shows them when to start, but he also constantly articulates their words, enhancing the phrasing with his arms, head and body, holding back the orchestra if they need a bit more time. This extraordinary connection between the singers and the orchestra is very rare and is part of his success as an opera conductor. During rehearsals, he may also use remarkable psychology with great singers to get what he wants. Nina Stemmer was Isolde in the Royal Opera House's production of Wagner's Tristan und Isolde, conducted by Sir Antonio Papano ten years ago. And she also sang the role here in Maestro Papano's studio recording of the opera. This is the Liebestod at the close of the work, as Isolde, as though transfigured with a vision of Tristan beckoning her to join him in death, ecstatically gives herself over to death in love as she sinks onto his body.
Wagner operas are torturous for the protagonists. Certainly, they pose vocal difficulties, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a psychological working out of their given situation, their given conflict, obviously. And the necessity of trying to explain complex human emotion was something that was fundamental for Wagner's art. Now, we talk about passion, we talk about emotion, and those words are bandied about when we talk about opera all the time. No, but Wagner is incredibly specific about motivation, much more so than Verdi. Verdi will create an event that stains a group of characters, that creates a tragedy, that creates an enormous conflict. It can be political, it can be personal, familial, historical, uh, religious. But with Wagner, it's extremely personal, intimate, but intimate to a degree that I mean, Wagner is a psychiatrist as well as being a musician. He's analyzing every single move his characters make and goes back into their memory, goes back into the history. And then, of course, mirrors that through these light motifs, these musical visiting cards that permeate the orchestral fabric so you you don't sometimes you don't even know you're hearing something and yet it's there uh, it's there reminding you sometimes subliminally of what the motivation what the character's really thinking even despite what they're saying so this layering of drama of a given moment is it's hugely complex, but it's fascinatingly complete also. And therefore, the need at the end of putting his characters really through the psychological ringer, he, in a certain way, feels sorry for them. And perhaps maybe feels sorry for the audience or feels the need to renew a vision of those characters or give us some kind of redeeming message. It's a very beautiful idea. And Wagner, of course, his point of departure is that always with his characters.
to drown now, sinking, unconscious, void of all thought, highest bliss. The close of Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. Nina Stemmer and the Royal Opera House Orchestra, conducted by Sir Antonio Papano. Playing on the recording in the first act of the opera was the orchestra's former principal percussionist, Nigel Bates. In the studio, Tony has again another energy. It's a very different uh, environment to that of the live theatre. Um, you have to sustain the performance element for three long hours, and that can mean a repeat of that for a whole week in every three-hour session because obviously you need to match the, the music you're doing at one point with something that's happened before. I remember doing the Tosca, what was called Tosca the Movie, which Tony conducted. It was an extraordinary experience. He had the ability to fire up the performing ensemble like, uh, like nothing else I've ever experienced in a studio, actually. And of course, that, maintaining that energy. And we were actually part of the movie ourselves, as uh, the orchestra and the singers in the studio became part of the film process. And you can see if um, you look carefully how Tony's treatment of every part of the drama is meticulously thought through and how his approach and his conducting is just what everybody needs time after time bar after bar and consistent and that's incredibly hard to achieve in a piece like Tosca <laughs> Before she stabbed Scarpia, Tosca had agreed Scarpia's terms that if she gave him her body, he would arrange a mock execution for her lover, Cavaradossi, so they could both go free. As the soldiers slowly and deliberately assemble to fire their guns, Tosca is full of apprehension as she watches from a distance. But when the gunshots ring out, she triumphantly shouts out to herself, There! Die! What an actor! The soldiers slowly depart, and when they have gone, Tosca runs up to Cavaradossi on the ground. Quickly, up, Mario, Mario, up, quickly, quickly, come, up, up. When he doesn't move, she realizes that Scarpia had betrayed her. It was always going to be a real execution. Scarpia's men rush in to arrest her as they have found his dead body, but she cries out that she will meet Scarpia before God, and she leaps from the battlement to her death before they can reach her. The soundtrack of the film of Puccini's Tosca. Angela Giorgiu is Tosca, and Sir Antonio Papano is the conductor. Sure. 
Cristo, so, Mario, Mario, su Cristo, andiamo. 